thank you very much for those very kind words. And, and, and uh, um, I certainly share with the ECB the importance of climate change as a, as a policy um, challenge, which, which we have to face. And I feel like, to some extent, I've already had a uh, good discussion of the paper I'm about to present, but I'm, uh, I'm going to go forward anyway. Uh, I think there's probably lots of commonality. And let, let me say at the outset that I'm really pleased to see the ECB po uh, posing this challenge of how we bridge together science and practice, which I believe to be a tremendously important task to be done and, and, and look, look for ways for doing that better. I think it's uh, just, and I think climate change is a, certainly a good example of where we need to do precisely this. Um, part of what I'm going to talk about is based on joint work with, uh, uh, um, with, Buzz, with Buzz Brock and Mike Barnett, and, and some of it will, will be, uh, they're not responsible, however, for all the stuff I'll be talking about here. They, they're probably like to distance themselves from somebody, I suppose, but anyway. So anyway, this is my, I, I think, how, how do you think about uncertainty and how we can cope with uncertainty in ways that are really grabs its nature? Um, and, and that's what I want to wrestle with today and, and, and talk about what I see as the challenges. Um, uh, so let me first, um, so um, Hayek wrote this very interesting essay as part of his uh, Nobel address. Usually when you get the Nobel Prize, you're supposed to write this address about why you won the prize, which kind of bores, bores most of the people writing essays. And so Hayek really took on this task about limits for understanding. There's lots of Hayek's essay that I would probably, that I disagree with, um, that I, about quantitative modeling and the like. But there's this one passage in here that in some sense keeps me up at night. It's just kind of a warning um, that, even if true scientists should recognize limits of studying human behavior, as long as the public has expectations, there will be people out there, I'm not saying, not the ECB, but that there will be people out there that, that pretend or believe they can do more to meet popular demand than what is really in their power. And this is what we want to guard against. This is how we want to use, uh, we, we want to recognize the limits of our understanding while not using that as an excuse for inaction. And so how do we do this in sensible and smart ways? And that's really, uh, I view as a challenge. And, and uh, how, um, how do we avoid the concerns expressed by Hayek? So when you confront policy uncertainty, there's this tension. On the one hand, there's this limited understanding of the mechanisms by which policy can influence economic outcomes. On the other hand, there's this demand for precise answers by the public or government or policymakers who have to communicate with the public. So how do we address that tension? How do we think and, and in a way that's constructive? So in the specific case of climate economics, let me just sketch out three different sources of uh, uncertainty. And, and I'll be filling in some gaps on each one of these. The first is climate sensitivity. And um, the simplest way to pose this is what are the temperature responses to changes in emissions? So we emit CO2 in the atmosphere today. It ha there's temperature responses tomorrow, in the future, multiple decades, and way far out. What are those? And what are those magnitudes? Next, um, beyond temperature changes, what, what are the environmental tipping points? Potentially dramatic consequences might be triggered after crossing some temperature anomaly threshold. How do we cope with those? Third, there's kind of damages. We're going to damage, uh, as we damage the environment, we can limit economic opportunities. There'll also be forms of adaptation. And how do we try to um, address those issues as well? So much of the existing quantitative research in climate economics to date has, put, has, put, has targeted the so-called social cost of carbon, which is uh, arguably somewhat more connected to fiscal policy. And so my first discussion is about illustrating how to uncertainty makes you think about um, policy in different ways. I'm going to be focusing on, on uh, the social cost of carbon calculation. Then I'll return to discussions of uh, central bank policy. So one approach to doing this um, that's, that's been advocated in, uh, by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, and by lots of researchers is to say, well, look, this is an interdisciplinary problem. We need inputs from you know, multiple sources, from multiple sources of, of expertise. And this um, 
this uh, study that I'm referring to refers to this so-called modular approach to the social cost of carbon. And, and they break these things down into four different modules. One is the social economic module. Um, it, it's involved in trying to figure out projections of uh, emissions of CO2. Um, yet, yeah, the next one is the climate module. This is the one where, where you know, we, uh, we're going to emit CO2 in the atmosphere. What imp impact is that going to have on the uh, overall climate system? The damage module, so, 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 so yes, yeah, so number two it involves climate scientists. The damage module, now we want to start talking about the economy's potential responses to these changes in the Earth system. And the final one is the so-called discounting model. And it's in, in a simplest form, although I'm going to be pushing well beyond this, there's a kind of, a, think about there being a time series of future damages. Social, um, uh, so we're going to damage the, uh, um, the economy today, uh, tomorrow, a decade, many decades, out many years. Um, how do we collapse? Think of that as a social adverse cash flow. How do we then uh, evaluate that social adverse cash flow and uh, reduce it down to a it's kind of a single present value? And that's what um, that, that gives us rise to a type of notion of um, the social cost of carbon. Now, shortly, I'm going to be pushing back or, 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 or at least talking about, um, about, this mod about going beyond this modular approach, which I think is going to be you know, tremendously important. But let me just put this approach out there. And this kind of, I think, um, is, is a framework that lots of people engaged in this measurement are, are, are kind of working within. So let me just talk about um, some of the evidence that comes out of, say, climate science. So climate models are highly complex. Uh, each, uh, they, they, they have ambitions in terms of both, both over space or over geography as well as time. They have potential, you know, they have not interesting nonlinearities and the like. And so do model comparisons across climate models is, is, is uh, potentially quite challenging to do. But, but one way that has proved useful is to look at so-called pulse experiments. You um, uh, run through these models on uh, uh, um, inputs of you know, a, a gigaton of uh, gigatons of carbon and then trace through their implications for uh, 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 for changes in temperature. And then, and then we see what the different models tell us and then we can make various different comparisons. So here I'm, I'm, I'm pulling off some models that, uh, I, I, that, that have been compared with in climate science literature. Um, uh, there's a, a very interesting paper by Ricky and Caldero that, and, and many others that are, that are engaged in these type of um, comparisons. And what we're doing here is um, the models, some models are featuring the mapping from emissions to carbon in the atmosphere. Other, other ones are featuring things like you know, carbon in the atmosphere into temperature changes. In some sense, we have to you know, we've combined you know, combine those type of uh, predictions, and that leads us, uh, in, in the case of this tabulation, at least to a total of 144 different model combinations. And so, what I reported here are the um, that impulse responses, if you like, to uh, uh, trying to trace through temperature changes in response to some exogenous input of carbon into the atmosphere, uh, it, it, some exogenous emission of carbon. And you see the models, the basic pattern is about the same across models. There's, you know, there's, there's this kind of peak effect, roughly speaking, over, over um, a decade, and then things flatten out. And, and uh, now if I were to extract, you know, um, what's long-term to economists and to what's long-term for a geoscientist are very, very different. So I think about 100 years as being long-term for them, that's like, that, that, that's like we're, uh, we're just getting going. So indeed, there are more trend dynamics that play out over long, you know, more longer time, time horizons. But over, over 100 years, this is, a, this, yeah, this is a pattern off of these um, different responses. And, and you'll see in the blue line, the mean response, um, and I'm also giving you the 25th and the 75th percentiles. And finally, the shaded region gives you the uh, upper and lower envelopes here. So, so the eventual impact of this um, emissions, you know, the, there's a substantial amount of input uh, of variation going all the way from um, the one degrees to just under three degrees in terms of their own. So, so this, is a, this is one source of uncertainty. So now I'm going to um, put on the table uh, a stochastic, uh, just a stochastic model of damages. And this is a highly stylized one. Uh, I'm not connecting this to any very explicit 
um, explicit data because it's a little bit uh, uh, kind of too too general of a level, but it captures the type of damage functions that are sometimes used uh, by um, uh, by environmental economists. And so I, got, so I think of this as tracing through proportional reductions in, in, in economic output. And there's lots of you know, disagreement or variance or, 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 or uncertainty about what those effects might be. And there's even uncertainty about the timing of when they might get triggered. So um, what I'm showing you here, you know, some people talk about a temperature anomaly of 1.5 as being critical. So here what happens is you've got fairly modest impacts on damages and then beyond 1.5, there's a chance things could get much more severe. And, 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 this, and this region here is kind of showing you the um, different ranges of possibilities that, yeah, that might occur um, if, you know, once we go beyond that anomaly. Now, we really don't know. You know it's, uh, there's been discussions of the threshold being 1.5. There's other discussions of being 2. Uh, there, so let me, so, um, so another possibility is that, well, it's really two degrees across the threshold, and then, fr then from that point on, things become much more serious, uh, you know, substantial, and severe. So, so this has to do with, uh, with, with this kind of tipping point uncertainty, if you will. Um, you, know, you know, at what point in time do it really tip the uh, uh, overall envir environment and therefore impacting economic opportunities? So what I want you to imagine here, and this is uh, just a highly stylized calculation to illustrate an important point, is imagine that we um, we can't really appeal to historical data to get get uh, to, uh, to get fine-tuned predictions about when these uh, thresholds exactly where these thresholds sit and the like. Um, but one can easily imagine that once we start experiencing the damages, we figure things out. So so, I, so I'm going to write down some dis, uh, social decision problems where I'm going to be, take, take a stark simplification by well, so let's suppose that there's uncertain when the threshold when that, uh, and that, like, where that where that threshold is between one and two degrees, but then once you cross it, you figure out uh, um, how much that curvature is in the damage function becomes revealed. Of course, you'd want a much rich, richer dynamic model of learning, but the idea is here is that once we start damaging the environment in more severe ways, um, things will become all the more uh, um, clear to us about the nature of the nature of the damage. There'll be uncertainty get, that gets resolved. And a lot of other treatments in, within the uh, social cost of carbon literature have no dynamic structures to, 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 the, uh, to the calculations. So here I want to put on the table, well, we're going to learn about stuff. Um, maybe we eventually learn it's very, very steep. But by that point in time, it may be very costly to act. So you know, some people say, well, let's just wait until we figure things out. Well, that, that waiting may be very, very costly. And so, 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 so it's this trade-off between acting now versus waiting and, um, until you know more. And, 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 and these pictures are to try to illustrate the um, aspects of that trade-off. So let me get back to this modular approach as we start putting uncertainty on the table. I think it really starts thinking about connections between these modules. So remember what they are. There's the, the socioeconomic, climate, damages, and discounting. Now, there's been lots of uses of so-called emission scenarios that are specified exogenously, um, and then we're uncertain about which ones are, which ones are are um, are going to play out. But I would argue, and, and, and based in part, and that's what's captured by those on those figures, that you know the plausibility of those scenarios is going to depend in part on the damages which we which which get revealed as as, as we push along those scenarios. If I'm on a high emission scenario and I'm surprised by how much damage is being done, then most likely there'll be some type of adaptive policy change, maybe maybe suboptimal or the like, but it's hard to imagine there wouldn't be at least some type of policy reactions to it. Um, so we really, you really have, a, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to be thinking about these emissions inputs coming from the social economic component, um, uh, independently of what damages we might emerge once we put uncertainty on the table. So that's one source of this connection between these uh, modules that the, with that just, that's important to think about simultaneously. There's also with the environmental economics literature, lots of discussions about discounting. Often what's done is you take a constant discount rate and you do some external sensitivity. But one of the lessons we've learned from asset pricing, um, from, from valuation, these lessons, you know, came for, for um, doing investment theory and private valuations, but they carry over also to social valuations, is that discounting should, in effect, be stochastic. That is, 
You should how much you discount things should depend in, in part on what gets realized in the future. And that, that again gets back to how severe the damages are to the underlying environment. And so you really want to, so, so a much more coherent approach is this probabilistic approach. Um, this is kind of what drives a lot of Drithers claims for us, but it really carries over to social valuation as well. And these probabilistic adjustments you're going to make are going to depend on the types of macro, about how the macro uncertainty plays out. So again, there's this interaction between this discounting module and what, and what you're thinking uh, and the nature of the economic damage is being done, done the potential damage is being done. And so there's a, so these modules, even though they have this appeal of making interdisciplinary research easy or easier, um, there's important interactions across these, which 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 really make you have to th start thinking about these things simultaneously. Once you want to treat uncertainty you know, explicitly. So I want to think about for me, there's two interesting type of uncertainty trade-offs I want to put on the table here. And you know, I'm interested in building mathematical models uh, informed by expert judgment and empirical evidence, but we want to use those models smartly, intelligently, and, and in wise ways. And so we saw that these type of discussions uh, get, get in some sense confused when people talk about the use of models even in the recent pandemics. Uh, models can produce things like best guesses. They can also produce potential bad outcomes. Uh, um, how much attention do we pay to the best guesses versus the bad outcomes? Now, that's a policy decision, uh, um, and it's not a scientific one, but it's a very important part of policy making once you take um, uncertainty into account. The other one is, what should we do now versus waiting for better information to become available? Um, so you know, some people naively argue that's why there's uncertainty, we should just wait and wait until we figure things out. But the problem is, is and, and Frank mentioned this in the outset, that could be a tremendously costly to society for doing that. So how do we frame that trade work trade out between how much we act now and how much we wait until that new information becomes available? This, these are the type of, this is where I think the tools of decision, decision theory and our uncertainty can come into play in very, in very important ways. So when I think about decision theory on uncertainty, I like to take a very broad perspective on it, and there's ways to formalize this. So let me draw through three distinctions that I find useful coming out of um, decision theory. Some of this is out of my own work. Some of this comes from statistics, control theory, and the like. So what we usually take up, teach in economics classes uh, is about risk. This is cases where we have unknown outcomes with known probabilities. Um, the so-called rational expectations model within macroeconomics and stochastic general equilibrium theory is all about risk. We uh, feed in these shocks. People, in, uh, uh, people, maybe econometricians don't know, but the people inside the models are are, are behaving as if they um, don't know probabilities but not outcomes. So we talk about risk aversion, risk prices, risk compensations. I think of that under this heading of risk. The next one's ambiguity. We've got multiple of models on the table. I showed you 144 different climate model configurations. How, how much do we weight each of those different outcomes? Do we weight them equally? Do we weight them differently, differentially? You know, you know. So is it, statistics in some sense has been all about this, this question for, you know, for many decades now. Um, but, this, but it remains an important source of uncertainty that goes beyond risk. How, how much confidence do we place in the different models? How do we weight them? Um, uh, there's, there's this whole theory of so-called subjective probability going back to um, DeFinetti, to Savage. It's very elegant. But even they argue that when you kind of fill in the holes of ambiguity with subjective probabilities, you can only do that very crudely. So how do we, do, how do we, confront, how do we confront that type of uncertainty? And the third one might be the most important one, it's, and it's uh, probably the hardest one to wrestle with, is misspecification. A model we write down in macroeconomics and economics more generally, and even other scientific disciplines, are in some sense misspecified. We build models that are tractable. We build models that um, are transparent. They give us insights. Um, we know that at some level they have to be flawed. So how do we know, um, given the flaws are sometimes in unknown ways, um, how, how do we use these models smartly um, and, uh, when we know that, when we recognize that misspecification? 
So all these are in hopes of building better ways to do uncertainty quantification designed specifically for dynamic models used for policy analysis. So, you know, without getting into formalism, the, you know, the mathematics and the, and the like, let me just kind of talk you through how these methods can work. How do we navigate uncertainty? So we want to use models sensibly. We don't want to give up on the tools of probability and statistics. We still need to bound the types of types of uncertainty that is entertaining. It's, it's, it, if you assume that there's you know, no balance whatsoever, you get uh, um, it's, it's, it's really not a very good guide for decision making. Um, it is, the outcomes in terms of decision making are going to depend on aversion. Just like risk aversion is a dislike of, of, of like not knowing outcomes, there's more generally an uncertainty aversion. It's you dislike uncertainty about probabilities over the future and events. And this gets in this trade-off between kind of worst case versus best guesses. How averse are we to, to these uh, forms of uncertainty? Now, how the implementation works is the following, is you put in these uncertainty components to the model. Uh, there's subjective uncertainties, which you're not quite sure about. You know, that they're, they may be very, very highly dimensional, but then you but then you line the calculations to tell you which parts of those uncertainty components matter and which ones are largely inconsequential. So, so computationally, or or what the nature of the methods are to figure out the components of uncertainty that really matter that have the most adverse consequences for the uncertainty a decision decision maker, and either you look to close the gap on information, or else you figure out uh, or or you uh, embrace those forms of. Uh, of, um, that, or you acknowledge, or you confront that adversity. And an outcome of all this is that we we might have some baseline probabilities, our, 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 our kind of best guesses at probabilities, but but the outcome of this is kind of an uncertainty probability adjustments that that uh, that, uh, that are pertinent for evaluation, along with robust decisions. These uncertainty adjustments are going to depend on the nature of the decision problem. They're going to depend on, the, uh, on, on what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, but there's kind of a nice set of probability tools that allow us to, uh, to, to again, capture these adjustments. And so these would be adjusted probabilities that are distinct from best guesses. And they're not the, they're not the probabilities the decision maker believes in. They're, they're the probabilities that help to design smart actions going forward. So let me return to climate science here um, and to climate policy under uncertainty. There's many calls for immediate climate policy and implementation, which I'm certainly sympathetic to. We're facing limits to our understanding of timing and magnitude of climate change as an impact, and this has led to the apprehension of some. How do we, how, um, we're interested in how a decision maker confronts this uncertainty in a setting in which there will be future information about the, the damage severity, Think about crossing that threshold and, and, and it becomes revealed how steep that is. Um, but we suspect the value of further empiricism is, is really quite limited. So we're really talking about problems where we're pushing economies into realms that they haven't experienced. Uh, and, and, and so, so just you know, looking at current evidence uh, can, can only get us so far. So you know, the aim is to apply recent developments of dynamic decision theory to kind of guide how we incorporate this uncertainty. So let me go back to that. Um, I, I gave you the outcome of those pulse experiments. And now I'm just going to tabulate the kind of limiting responses. I'm going to literally what I'm going to do is I'm going to take those those impulse responses and just discount them at a very low discount rate and, and, th and then show you what I'm going to call the climate sensitivity. So off the 144 different models, this is what those kind of um, discounted imp uh, uh, impulse responses look like to uh, changes in emissions, and yeah, you know, this captures that that you know, that range I was talking about in that in, in that, pre, in, um, that previous diagram. So we have to think about how I form this histogram. I'm basically treating all 140 40 outcomes equally, so it's like assigning a, the exact same weight to all 144 model different combinations, which you know may not be the right thing to be doing here, and you may well, yeah, there's yeah, there's um, there's uncertainty about how you might want to weight these different model combinations. There's also going to be uncertain damage thresholds. 
So here what we're going to imagine is we're going to capture these uncertainty thresholds by a jump process, and then we're going to jump to 20 possible different um, uh, uh, trajectories for the damage function curvature. So each state in that sense is going to correspond to a value of that curvature. Um, and, and we'll start off, say, at just a baseline probability that there's a uniform distribution over the uh, 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 20 different potential curvatures. One could use other, other baselines. Now, the decision maker does not know ex ante when the jump takes place. Instead, he'll follow what's done in kind of Poisson modeling. There's, a, um, there's, there's some type of jump intensity, and I'm going to just have it increase as I, that's making jumps more and more likely as I range between y, lo, uh, between y lower bar and y, you know, y upper bar. Now, I can write this down all, all probabilistically, but you know, it's, my, my knowledge of how to do this is really pretty sparse. And so it's a case where I wanted to be more robust when, uh, um, and, and not having to rely, rely precisely on probability calculations also makes considerable sense. So I talked about these ambiguity adjusted uh, or, or, or um, probabilities. So in terms of climate sensitivity with 140 deported different models, I can imagine taking the original red histogram, treating all models alike, and say, well, I'm not sure that's the right way to weight things. Perhaps I should tilt the histogram and, let, and look what happens. And so here I've tilted it using a blue hit, using a blue histogram, with the purple being the overlap of the two histograms. And so I move things up because it's, yeah, and this comes out of a formal calculation, but it's intuitively clear why you'd want to go upwards, because that's the case which ought to be a bigger concern to, to the decision maker. Suppose there's more climate sensitivity than is captured by the, say, mean of this, uh, of this original red histogram. And, and, and then what are the consequences of, dying, of, of making that shift? Similarly, there's a, the, this, this um, there's, there are these uh, uh, probabilities which we've assigned over the different curvatures. So, so think of this gamma three as a measure of that damage function curvature. How much damage I'm going to do once I cross this uh, on this threshold? We're looking for things that are so-called exponential quadratic here, and that's a kind of a quadratic coefficient in the tail. Now, I, I start off in the red histogram, and that's a uh, that's that's one in which we're um, uh, treating them all different gamma threes as equally gamma, equally likely, and then if I, a modest amount of robustness moves me to the blue histogram, I'm saying, well, I'm not you know, treating them all equally likely. It just seems like that's a stretch. What happens if I move it a little bit? Um, I can push it further, uh, it's, you know, depending upon how concerned I. Am. I, uh, I am about that misspecification or robustness that pushes me to the middle one. And then if I'm extremely concerned, I get pushed all the way to, uh, to the one on the right. And so the calculations I'm going to do next are just going you know, to you know, trace through the one in the middles. And um, so what I'm doing here is kind of this mapping between the type of parameters I have to input into these calculations into, into these probabilities, these, uh, these, um, these adjusted probabilities. And, the, and, and this idea of looking at the adjusted probabilities goes back to robust Bayesian decision making, um, uh, uh, you know, many, many decades. And so, and so looking at these and trying to assess which one of these look like crazy, we might think the one the right is maybe too extreme, maybe the one on the left is too passive, um, that, that those type of calculations I, th I find to be revealing. So I'm going to apply this now those, these, to the social cost of carbon. Um, so the social cost of carbon, I described it heuristically, but its actual meanings and targets differ across two different applications. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be featuring one of these applications, but the insights all have, but, but uh, there's also similar insights that carry over to the other. The one I'm going to be using is the so-called one based on Pagubian tax policy. So I'm going to invent this fictitious social planner. I'm going to ask the, the, the fictitious so, social planner to figure out um, the socially re uh, relevant amount of carbon emissions instead of the ones that are, um, would occur in a market economy. There's an externality here. Um, and then from that, I can look at the shadow price for that planner's problem uh, of carbon, of carbon emissions. And that's, I'm going to call that the social the social cost or value of that kind of, of carbon. And then from that, one can figure out what the corresponding Pagubian tax policy on carbon emissions that, that corrects that externality. So the question is, how, what does uncertainty do to this so-called social cost of carbon? Um, now, there's other measures of the social cost of carbon that um, 
uh, that want, um, that that instead imagine that you uh, you uh, conjecture about a future of the world, and then you do small changes uh, in, in the emissions policy. You do a, a local perturbation, and then you uh, from that you can kind of you know back out again a type of asset pricing type calculation on this. Uh, you know, a discount in social cost. And many calculations are, are, are based on the latter one, um, although it's, uh, the ones I'm going to show you are based on the former. So here I'm just going to kind of show you the outcome. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take you to the kind of the logarithm of the social cost of carbon coming out of the calculation. And I'm going to, you know, look at, look over a range of uh, temperature anomalies before I hit 1.5 degrees. Now, if I treat all, if I treat the baseline probabilities is just the right problem. Yeah, it's just the probabilities and solve this problem. I'm I'm left with a red line. And, and so um, if I go through those different amounts of robustness, say I was saying the green is an intermediate case, say, then you then you can see that you've got like um, maybe a thirty potentially up to a thirty percent increase in the social cost of carbon by adjusting for the uncertainty. And this is adjusting for uncertainty both in terms of the uh, climate side as well as the uh, damage side. And so these uncertainty adjustments, I would argue, you know, within this illustration, um, can be very important and and uh, um, and, and be non-trivial. And there's kind of these quantitative methods for doing it. So now, what happens after you jump? Okay, so this is a case where you're going to act. You're you're you're, you're, you're going to have to take action. You're going to cut back on emissions, so uh, socially optimal emissions, right from the outset. Now, now there's this information that gets revealed about how severe the damage damage parameter is. Well, one possibility is it's not very severe at all. The quote good news, and other possibilities are that oh, it's more severe than I might have thought. There's kind of an asymmetric response in the emissions afterwards. There is certainly a good news response over a small range of these uh, gamma curvature uh, of, the, of this gamma three that, that that lead to larger emissions. But then things flatten out and and, and are. Um, so, so, so there's a pretty strong asymmetry in the nature of this response uh, due to the uh, uncertainty aversion faced by the uh, decision maker. And so just to summarize, our decision maker identifies two key, uh, the, the solution identifies two key results. The planner in, exhibits initial caution until damages are more fully revealed. This information, with this information, the decision may be more wary or more bullish. But there's a pronounced asymmetry in the responses, with so a small fraction of the bu of, of more bullish responses and a clustering of responses that are more cautious. And so th these are the type of you know the, using these tools of uncertainty you know, allows to think about these type of dynamic these dynamic considerations and these trade offs between um, how averse we are to um, um, to the uncertainties and how that affects our actions. So in my remaining time, let me just. Uh, I'm going to talk just very briefly about financial stability and and um, and central bank policy. This isn't going to be any attempt. It's a broad-based critique of uh, central bank policy, and I uh, and and and, I'm, uh, and I think that central banks are faced with very interesting and important challenges here. So, if I go back to the construct of so-called systemic risks that that was really featured at the original uh, um, crisis, financial crisis. The earlier financial crisis, which, which we, which we uh, experienced, the global financial crisis, um, there's been lots of work done for modeling. Um, there's been lots of repairs of existing quantitative models. Um, I think the more kind of fundamental modeling successes, although, although have remained to be more largely qualitative, we're, we're still sorting through different aspects of that, of that um, so-called systemic risk. Um, what what do things like what are the consequences of these uh, kind of big of big perturbations to uh, the overall financial sector? So now we're asked to integrate climate change into that current understanding, um, and that's a uh, and that and that's going to be quite a challenge, a modeling challenge. I think it's a very important one going forward, one that I certainly embrace, but I but I don't want to uh, overstate exactly what we know at this juncture. Now, climate change. Is different than a lot of the crises type considerations which we're concerned with and thinking about um, banking crises or thinking about the financial crisis alike. And that has to do with the time scale where we seek to quantify the uh, uncertainty. So if we go through like you know, 
think about changes over decades, multiple decades in the life, that's very different than the type of um, challenges where, that, that we think about when we're facing other type of financial crises. And, I think, and that's a very important consideration. And, and, and there's also a challenge for, uh, uh, for say, regulators in terms of whose models we use to assess the exposure of financial institutions. And you know, this, this is, distinction is, can be very, very important. Um, uh, and this is a point that's been made by this paper forthcoming in general finance called the limits to model-based regulation, in the sense that they say you have to rely on the models of the re people being regulated. You're opening the door to distortions that they may uh, understate relative to uh, what a, where an external regulator might, might confront as, the, uh, uh, as exposures of which they might have to say, say climate change. So this issue about whose models are we going to use in order to do the regulation also comes into play here. Can... Um, so for me, I think the important challenge is for to, how do we quantify these exposures to, to, uh, to climate uncertainty. I already talked about the nature of the uncertainties we're facing here, all the way from not just pure risk to thinking about um, amp model ambiguity, model misspecification, their consequences and the like. Um, and when we think about this climate change, uh, are we thinking about whether there's this fundamentally sy systemic aspect to it, or are we thinking, uh, alternatively, are we thinking about that, well, maybe everyone in the, in the financial sector quantifies this in a way, uh, understates what it is, and that spills over, that becomes a source of this um, systemic concern. The problem here is we can't let, kind of expect these financial institutions to turn loose their existing modeling uh, expertise because, because we're talking about something that we have very limited historical experience on. Um, and, and so there's a, there's potential a legitimate concern that we, you know, the private sector might collectively underestimate the magnitudes of exposure to climate change. And I, and I think that's something worthy of uh, potential consideration. Um, for me, what this should do is seems like it ought to um, open the door to even more discussions, hard discussions about how we um, put regulator and regulated onto the same page as what climate exposures are and what nature, what's the precise nature of those exposures and how, to, and how we do that in a way that's meaningful for decision making. How do we do that that, that, that would help the, the uh, financial institutions in their own dynamic decision making as they confront uncertainty? So, um, so I know the central banks have been good in the past of trying to you know, pull wisdom and the like. Um, I think there's much more that can be done here about kind of really thinking through from the ground zero how we quantify exposures to climate change. I think this is really an, a very much of an open question. And, 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 and to the extent we can start getting people on the same page on this, I think it can be very productive. Now, there's been a lot of focus at the start on so-called scenario-based stress tests. And some of these go out for up, uh, upwards of 30 years. Some of the motivations for these, I think, have been not well-conceived. Um, but the idea is to confront extreme uncertainties, factor climate change. And, 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 and at least you'll see some writings that say, well, we're gonna, we don't know how to assign probabilities to things. So we're just going to produce scenarios as well. But sensible decision makers, like the financial institutions, they don't have that liberty. They have to think through dynamic decision making uh, in order to do smart, in, uh, in order to engage in smart courses of action. Um, now we're gonna explore events through well-defined scenarios that extend through three decades and then investigate tail, uh, yeah, tail events in the climate system. Now these scenarios, um, I talked about before, we really have to, one has to think hard about, uh, about, about how to put them on the table, table to begin with. And, are, and, and how far can you go with just thinking about stress scenarios when they play out over three decades without, without thinking more comprehensively about um, on the full distribution of the possibilities of climate change. So I think there's, limit, I think there's great limits to what you can imagine doing here with uh, just avoiding probabilities altogether, playing things out over 30 years and not putting some type of dynamic information structure in things. So here, let me take you a figures from the Bank of England report. Um, these are just illustrations. They, I, of course, the Bank of England, of course, has you know, more ambitious ideas on the table. I, so, so, so I don't mean to be trivializing what they're doing here. But this is a useful illustration here because you'll see these different trajectories. There's an early and late policy trajectory and no, no additional policy action trajectory. And some of these trajectories follow each other and then eventually break off. Those patterns are very interesting, but they suggest that 
part of the scenarios has to be, well, at some point in time, you know, I don't know what's going to, I don't know which path I'm on until some time in the future, then all of a sudden I'm, I'm going to branch and, 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 and something, you know, and then I'm going to adapt to that. So in the decision making, we already saw this intertemporal trade off here between how you behave when information has become available in the future. So these trajectories, it seems to be shown. Um, Probabilities should, I don't think, can be avoided completely, uh, but some type of probability bounds have to at least be, um, at least be entertained. Dynamic information structure seems to be, has to be put on the table in order to, in, in, in order for us to expect the uh, financial sectors to have meaningful responses to, um, to, uh, uh, to these types of scenarios. So to me, there's a limited series stress test, and it's important not to overstate what the value is. They're static, typically, with no one sitting on the path. And they potentially miss these two lessons I talked about from decision theory, this trade-off between bad outcomes versus performing well over likely outcomes. You could, it's, one can perform really well under bad outcomes alone and, and perform miserably under, on, under, under other ones. And we should expect the decisions to respond recursively to the state dynamics and information revolution. So it'd be good to push beyond these type of uh, stress tests to add, add, to add in a more dynamic structure to them. Um, there's, a, there's a potential here for providing mis, misguided paths for economic and environmental outcomes without explicit dynamic modeling. I already talked about the danger of these emissions trajectories without thinking through the uh, potential consequences that they might have for endogenous policy in the future. And I, and, and I worry that these stress tests answers might implicitly start conditioning on a path. If you tell me what's going to happen over 30 years, then of course I can, I, I can design a policy that, I can design a policy that confronts a climate change of that nature, but that's not what we want the answers to be doing. So in some sense, a more idealized stress test, which is of course infeasible, would be to imagine the banks submit to the regulator a whole range of their, their full menu of policy outcomes, and then the banks themselves could run the stress test based on those answers. But that, that is, that, that's more pie in the sky at this juncture. But I think shunting probabilities and pushing dynamic information structure to the background is, is kind of productive. And perhaps the whole notion of a 30 year stress test at this, at, at this juncture is, 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 uh, um, is, is say premature as opposed to thinking more short term in terms of how these, in terms of responses to climate change uncertainty. And it's interesting that as, as, um, as you go more short term, one of the interesting forms of uncertainty that these uh, institutions are, are going to face is policy uncertainty occurring from outside the uh, central banks, which is uh, which which puts the central banks in, in an awkward position of trying to assess the uh, uh, uncertainties coming from other aspects of government. So I I don't have a simple solution to have that, uh, uh, to say fixing the stress test problem, but I just want to uh, I do worry that there's um, um, that, that we assign too much. In, um, uh, credence to what uh, can be learned from them. So with that, let me just kind of close here. Um, I think fiscal policy has the biggest potential as a tool for confronting climate change, with monetary policy playing a more supportive role. For me, the time horizon over which climate change uncertainty plays out is different than other forms of turbulence on the radar screen of central banks. This creates unique challenges for oversight or regulation. I think understanding better the sources of the subjective uncertainty in models used by the private sector and by governments in regards to climate change will make oversight all the more effective. Thank you very much.